Welcome to the Friday edition of Back to the Bible. Today, Pastor Nat Crawford shares a fascinating interview with Professor Christopher Yuan. How does a gay agnostic become a Christian professor at Moody Bible Institute? Find out as Christopher shares his amazing story. Now, let's join Pastor Nat Crawford and his guest, Christopher Yuan. Christopher, great to have you here today. Uh, thanks for having me on, Pastor Nat. A few years ago, I actually found out about you. Uh, I, my mother, she's big into listening to Christian radio. Mm -hmm. And there was this one day, she goes, Nat, I've been crying nonstop because of mm -hmm. God's grace. I heard about this gentleman who, who got saved through just an incredible set of circumstances. And now this guy is a professor. You would love him. And I'm always like, Mom, I, whatever, I don't have time. But I listened. Mm -hmm. I made the time and I listened to your story and it blew me away. So mm -hmm. for those who are unfamiliar with your personal story, can you just give us a brief overview of how you came to faith in Christ? Because I would say by far, it is not a typical path to becoming a Bible professor. Yes, I would say that's a good way to put it, Nat. Very atypical. Yeah. Um, and and a big part of probably why your mother really connected with it is because it my, my parents, and particularly my mother, is a really integral part of, of my faith mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, both of them, my parents, my mom and my father, were not Christian. They came to the U.S. for graduate school. They were born in China, raised in Taiwan, met in college in Taiwan, and then came here to get their doctorate for graduate school. And my parents were not Christian, so we didn't own a Bible. We didn't go to church, none of that. And mm -hmm. I wrestled with my sexuality from a young age, but I kept it hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. And then in my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet. And I broke mm -hmm. the news to my parents. I'm from Chicago, so Midwest. And then I moved from Chicago to Louisville, where I was pursuing my doctorate in dentistry. My dad's a dentist, and mm -hmm. so it kind of just seemed quite a natural fit. It's, it is a great pr profession. And so after a year of dental school, I decided to go home and break the news to my parents. And I told my mom and dad, I am gay. Mm -hmm. It was my declaration. Well, my mother, kind of being your typical Asian mom, tiger mom, <laughs> the situation, she gave me an ultimatum and she said, you must either choose the family or choose that. She couldn't even say the words. Well, for me at that time, this was, you know, this was not a choice. I believe the lie. This is who I am. And I told my mom, if you can't accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. I left home, went back to Louisville, devastated my mom. In addition to that, the timing was awful. My parents' marriage was a wreck. They actually had began the paperwork for a divorce. And on the next day, she just decided she was going to do the unthinkable. She was going to end her life. Wow. Amazingly, God gave her life. Hmm. And uh, she had planned to go to Louisville, uh, say goodbye to me for the last time, and just end it all. She went to see a minister of all things. Again, remember, we were not Christians. So, I mean, everything is just more than serendipitous. It's God's sovereign hand over the so, situation, yes. bringing, drawing us to himself. She doesn't remember anything that this minister <laughs> said. But he gave her a little pamphlet. And she took that little pamphlet and her purse, nothing else. She didn't pack and boarded a, 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 the train, one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville. Hmm. She planned to get, say goodbye to her. She read, read this little booklet which shared with her the gospel. She'd never heard it before. Hmm. And she gave her life to Christ. So she went, wow. the way she says it is she went to Louisville expecting to end her life. And in reality, hmm. she did. One of her wow. favorite verses is Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. Uh -huh. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hmm. So Christ living in them, and within a few months, my father also uh, became a follower of Christ, and you know that prepared my parents for the rough years ahead as I headed further and further away from God. And I just wanted nothing to do with God. Hmm. Uh, I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs. You know, when I wasn't going to school, I was out partying and having fun. Just you know what all students who don't know Christ did: have fun. Hmm. Life is short. So I uh, spent most of my free time in the gay clubs. I went from relationship to relationship, seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, mm -hmm. but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. And I always need to be, I always need to mm -hmm. clarify, not all gay men do drugs, not all gays and lesbians are promiscuous. Of course, some are, some are not. Mm -hmm. But regrettably, that is part of my story. And when I tell my story, I have to be totally honest and authentic about and tell the whole part. But I also want to remind 
the watchers and listeners that when you encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, he will impact every aspect of your life. Amen. So I began experimenting with drugs, but like my classmates, I was poor. And if I was going to do drugs, I needed to find a way to support my habit. And I did that by selling drugs. I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. Because mm -hmm. I actually thought, this is the funny thing, I actually thought I could live this double life. Wow. A graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. Mm -hmm. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my mom and dad flew from Chicago to Louisville. And, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, great, they're coming. They're going to fight for me. They're going to stand up for me. They're going to tell the school, you know, what to do, you know, whatever, and, you know, and they're going to threaten the lawsuit. And I would, I would graduate just, I had three more months. I would graduate in three months and get my doctorate. Hmm. Well, to my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother looked at the dean and said, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that a Christopher becomes a Christ follower. Hmm. She said that, you know, they were going to support whatever decision the school made. Well, Nat, just imagine how <laughs> infuriated I was. I was like, that's, not, that's not the plan. You know, my mom knew that nothing was more important than me following Jesus, more important than mm -hmm. edu education, more important than even career. Remember, this is a Chinese mom saying this. Right. And she, I mean, it was so counterculture, counter herself mm -hmm. to do this, but she knew that nothing was more important than me following Jesus. Wow. Well, I was devastated. I was so angry. I, I just stormed out of that office and I moved further away from Chicago to the bright lights, big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community in Atlanta. And I became actually a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all money, fame, drugs, and sex. Hmm. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, because in my world, I had become God. Hmm. So my parents had no clue that I was doing drugs. They, didn't, they had no, they've never even seen drugs before. They didn't know what a guy looked like that was high. But they <laughs> knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried mm -hmm. to reach out to me, love of Christ. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta, actually, and I kicked them out. I, after the second day, I had enough. And, and, you know, the funny thing is they were not telling me I was living in sin. I knew what they believed. They weren't preaching at me. They weren't, you know, bashing me over the head with a Bible, any of that. They weren't reading me Bible verses. But just the fact that they had, God had so radically transformed their lives that they radiated Christ, that was offensive to me. And I told hmm. them to leave. And we hear the narrative today that Christian, Bible believing, evangelical, gospel centered parents cannot love. They're gay children. Hmm. You have to actually shed off that ancient, outdated, old-fashioned teaching to actually love your gay children. That's what you hear from the culture. Hmm. I had the exact opposite experience. My parents were not Christian, hmm. and they rejected me. It wasn't until they became followers of Christ that they could do nothing other than to love me as God loved them while they were weak, while they were still sinners, and while they were enemies, while we are enemies. That's how God loved, and they, they loved me in that same way. Wow. Well, I kicked them out, but before my dad left, he wanted to give me something. Hmm. He wanted to give me his very first Bible. Oh, wow. I had the notes in the margins. He was all dog-eared. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. Hmm. Like, I didn't want him to think that I actually might read it. Huh. He left it on my kitchen counter anyway and walked out the door. Hmm. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash can. Wow. I wanted nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. Hmm. I wanted nothing to do with God, with their newfound religion. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was totally unreachable. Hmm. Completely hopeless. Hmm. But my mom and dad committed 
not to focus upon the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. Wow. And along with over, literally over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, hmm. from their Bible study fellowship group, they cried out to God for me. My mom began to pray a bold and scary prayer. Hmm. God, do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. Hmm. That's a scary prayer for a mom. That's a scary prayer for a Chinese mom to make. <laughs> In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years. She knew that it was going to take a miracle, a, a total miracle, hmm. to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. So I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs. And I was charged hmm. with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. Wow. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I'd started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I mm. found myself in the ditch among society's despised mm. in the Laddie City Detention Center. Mm. So I tried calling my friends, you know, my those people that always say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. <laughs> those <laughs> friends that really got me more into trouble than anything else. Well, what I didn't know was I had a praying mother at home. Mm. And she knew years ago that as long as I had those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. Remember, she loves bold prayer, prayers. Well, she prayed specifically years ago that somehow, some way, God would cause all of those friends to desert me. Hmm. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was down to the bottom of the list home. And I, I was just dreading making that phone call, just thinking of the earful that I was going to get on the other mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. but my mother's first words were, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm just reminded of what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness mm -hmm. that leads us to repentance. Not God's anger, not God's wrath. But it's God's kindness that mm. leads us to repentance. And on that miserable, awful day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. A few days after, I was walking around the cell block, and I passed by this garbage can. And as I looked at this trash, I'm like, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates, and I was just a few months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made, but now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. I was about to pass by this garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. Ben over picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. Uh -huh. I took that New Testament back to my cell, opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night, but I was not thinking this is the answer to my problems. Actually, I simply thought I've got a ton of time on my hands, and I better pass it somehow. But as we know, what we have in our Bible is not just ink on paper, but what we have is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pre-sight, and I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called to the nurse's office, and I was handcuffed, and as I sat down, I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words, and so she wrote something on a piece of paper, slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. Mm. A few days later, I was laying in my prison cell. And I looked up at the cold metal bunk above me, and somebody had scribbled something, and it read, If you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. Mm. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. 
I mean, it could have been any verse in the whole Bible, but God used these words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that if God could have a plan for Israel in exile, rebellious Israel in exile, he could even have a plan for me. I had no idea where that plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day, the next, and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my dependencies, obviously drugs, but within a few months, God delivered me from that addiction. But, you know, there was something that, that I wanted to cling on to, and that was my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. And, I, and out to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. He even gave me a book explaining that view. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand, the Bible in the other. And from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. Hmm. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. Mm -hmm. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of Scripture looking for justification. I couldn't find any. Wow. So I was at a turning point, and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God and His Word, live as a gay man, by, and pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attraction, and this is important, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. Wow. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence pass, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. And that's true. But don't we as sinners, don't we like to add to God's truth? I added so, therefore, he doesn't want me to change. Similar to people when they say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. Hmm. But after reading the Bible several times, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Hmm. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay, is not ex-gay, is not even heterosexual for that matter, because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. Hmm. God says, be holy, for I am holy. I thought in the past that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual. And what did that mean? Well, that meant the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. <laughs> but I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to resist sin. So actually, heterosexuality as we define it, as the world defines it, as Freud defines it, isn't actually the right goal, correct direction, but it's not precise enough. And if you think about it, God doesn't not command us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual, but neither does he say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. And God, instead, God says, be holy for I am holy. Therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or not whether I'm tempted. But the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. Wow. Well, as I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life, and he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places, and I realized I need to learn more about the Bible. So I called them, collect to my parents, told them, I think God's calling me to ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of at that time called Moody Bible Institute. But then there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> <laughs> they mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited to fill it out until I got to the last page where I realized I needed references. 
or these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. Well, I had some slim pickings in prison. <laughs> but I was able to pers persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my reference to Moody. So amazingly, Moody actually accepted me. <laughs> wow. I was released from prison July 2001, started the very next month in August. So think about my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> <laughs> Graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in exegesis, and then got my doctorate in ministry 2014. And then 2011 was when I had the incredible blessing and honor to co-author a, a book with my mom called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. It's pretty cool. We She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two, she wrote chapter two. So they're alternating narratives, interwoven uh, chapters, uh, because we want to tell you from our own voice, same situation told from two totally different perspectives, and then how the God and His power and His grace brought us all back together. Christopher, I know that there are people who are listening and watching today. Of course. Who they're saying, that's my kid. Yeah. That's my kid. Yeah. They, they, they're, they're the prodigal. And now they're gay or they're transgender. And mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Like, I want to love them unconditionally, mm -hmm. but I can't condone what they're doing how can they do this? How, what are the practical ways for them to love them, to show them Christ, but also not to endorse that lifestyle? I, help them out. You know, I, I think one of the first things that we need to realize is uh, what is of ultimate importance is that we believe that there is a God and that Jesus Christ is his son, and that we are sinners, and that is why we need Jesus Christ to be our savior. I mean, do they know that? Have they heard us articulate clearly the gospel? Because what we need to recognize is our children's rebellion, turning from God, and I'm gonna broaden out to more than just sexuality. The core issue is not the drugs or the sexuality. That's a peripheral issue. The core issue is actually a lack of faith. The core issue is that they have walked away from God, or they're even believing this false gospel. And that's just a whole nother layer of complexity. Yeah. But another thing that I really want to encourage parents is this, this misunderstanding that they are the ones to blame for their child's rebellion. It's not your fault. Recognize that your children are sinners and don't view that, you know, maybe your son or daughter who identifies as gay is somehow worse than your other son, you know, or daughter who's not following Christ. Again, the main thing is surrendering fully to Christ. And that can help as a mother or father to pray correctly for what it is exactly that we want God to do in their lives, to surrender to Christ. I can feel our listeners right now just like lose a thousand pounds off their back. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, as a, as a parent, we have three small boys and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of pressure and we're doing as much as we can to lead by example and to love That's them cool. unconditionally and show them, you know, respect and all these things. But at the end of the day, we have no control over what they do ultimately and yes. what they decide to do with their future. And we have to hand them over to God Amen. and allow God to do the work. And, and when I say that, it's like, man, that sounds so so simple and straightforward and easy because he's God. But yet that's not what we want to do as, as creatures who want to play God so often. But yes. uh, Christopher, your story, uh, again, is just incredible and a testimony of God's grace and what God does every day day. It's an everyday miracle. Again, Christopher, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Oh, thanks for having me on that. This is Back to the Bible with Pastor Nat Crawford. Now, let me share this quick reminder. This week, we're kicking off our September challenge with a generous $130,000 challenge grant. This means your gift today will go twice as far when paired with this generous grant. And to thank you, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This is our new fall devotional book featuring three months of daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425, 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit backtothebible.org. Pastor Nat here. Take some time this weekend to worship the Lord, but also evaluate your heart in light of this teaching. And always remember, stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. 
Don't miss any of our episodes. Subscribe to Back to the Bible or find them all at backtothebible.org.